All right, welcome everybody to another How It Works. Um, I'm gonna keep trying to do these as much as possible uh, with the new th um, things that are gonna be landing in 4.0 and some of the things that I've cleaned up dramatically or we have cleaned up dramatically for 4.0 um, because I really want people to understand the internal mechanics of CanJS now that they're getting a lot of polish for 4.0, which should help people contribute new ideas and, and new things um, because a lot of the new tools inside CanJS make creating your own custom observables, things like that, much, much easier. Um, so yesterday I did CanKeyTree, which is how you can contain, uh, well, helps you like track observable handlers uh, in a nice in a nice way. Um, and then today I'm going to be talking about CanQs, which is CanJS's queuing mechanism. This replaces the Can batch of CanJS 2.3 and earlier, which was kind of a queuing system that was, I mean, it was just mostly like you would add then handlers that you wanted to be called back and it would just loop through them. There was this batch number. Um, there was actually another queuing system inside CanJS 2, which was inside Can Observation, it had its own. Um, and it was really complex and not well coordinated. And can queues is an attempt to solve two problems. Uh, the first being that, well, it avoids some of the errors and just simplifies like how uh, someone can understand what tasks are being run when inside CanJS. And then the other problem that it solves is it makes debugging a lot easier if you understand the queuing system, what it outputs, um, that sort of thing. So with that being said, um, and please stop me if there's any questions, uh, let's get into it. So again, I'm mostly just gonna be going through the documentation that I that I just wrote fresh off the press's documentation that you can't see yet because I haven't published it to the, the 4.0 CanJS docs, but this will be out uh, soon. So can queues, I already kind of talked about some of the, the reasons why we set out to do can queues, but what are queues useful for um, generally? Uh, and can queues is, a, is basically a queuing system. Uh, queues are beneficial for performance and for determinism. In a browser, a lot of times you want certain tasks to happen at the same time. For example, those that change the DOM. Um, CanJS has begun to, we'll see a, later, there, uh, there's a DOM UI queue inside CanJS where things like CanView Live are scheduling uh, DOM mutations. I don't think all of them are quite yet scheduled there, but some of the big ones like each are scheduled there, uh, which is great because then if they all happen at the same time, um, then especially in the future, I'd like to time this up with a request animation frame so you can avoid browser repaints and things like that as you're changing the DOM. The other, and this is the really important one, the reason why we did it is determinism. Um, you want to provide assurances about when things happen inside CanJS. Um, and especially with CanJS, we want to provide um, consistency of if, if you, in a callback, and like if you're listening to an event handler and you read any other stateful value, um, ex including values that derive from other values, that it will be fully up to date when you read it. And so this is determinism. And this, this is a big part of, of why we did it. Um, let's give a quick example of where determinism could go wrong. If you didn't have the determinism, the bad, like the bad situations you could find yourself in as a programmer. So let's say I had an observable person whose name was Fran, age 15. I had uh, an observable, like a can compute, that was deriving some information about Fran. She's 15 and, and also another observable that's deriving whether Fran can vote or not, whether she is over 18 years old in the US or not. Now let's say I listen to info and on can vote. And what I was gonna do is log the value that we just got for info 
and whether the and the value of the other kind of corresponding value. So in info, I logged the new info and whether the person can vote or not. I didn't realize I'm missing a plus. And in can vote, I'll log their their uh, whether they can vote or not, and I'll read info. Now let's say I set person age to 19, right? So they can vote. What would you expect to happen? Would you expect info's event handler to be fired first and it to say, okay, Fran is uh, 19 and uh, can vote false because can vote hasn't updated yet? And then can vote, this handler would say, oh, uh, can vote is true and Fran is uh, 19. Right, that that you would get kind of weird results. Hopefully, you wouldn't expect that. <laughs> that's what that's what you would have if you didn't have determinism. If essentially we ran all of info's event handlers immediately before also updating can votes value. So what CanJS is essentially it makes sure it updates all values before it fires off all events, and this is why you need separate queues. Um, so, um, CanJS has four different queues, and we're going to talk about like um, understanding what the que which queues do what. I kind of zoomed in here, but the notify, derive, DOM UI, and and uh, mutate queues. Hmm, Jason, we might need to make sure that we can scroll horizontally if it's needed with images. For sure. Um, I'm kind of zoomed in. A normal browser should be able to do it, but I'm zooming a lot here. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about those in a moment. But generally speaking, um, so CanJS has these four queues, and the, each of these queues have different ways of running their tasks, especially notify and mutate are actually the same but derive and DOM UI are kind of special queues. But anyways, the, essentially you register tasks, which are just functions to be run in, in these queues. And then whenever you start running, can't just running tasks, it runs all of notify queues tasks before derive queues. And then it finishes those and goes to DOM UI queues, and then finishes those and goes to mutate queue. If anything happens, like DOM UI queue somehow creates a new notify, task, that notified task will run immediately before it comes back to DOM UIQ. I'll explain this more later. Um, but essentially, what you, what you do for the most part is you enter in a bunch of tasks between a start and a stop call, queues batch start, queues batch stop. You can register a bunch of tasks, and those little tasks will start running at the end of the stop, at the when stop is called. So here's how I could in queue a console log. Essentially, you in queue a function, you tell it what you want it's this to be, and it's arguments. Um, queues batch start and stop work just like the CanJS 2.3 uh, can event batch start and stop, where that you can call it multiple times, and it, there's kind of a counter inside, and only when the counter is back to zero, does it actually start running the tasks? And this is nice. Um, if you, the same thing holds true with if you're batching things in um, CanJS 4.0, it will prevent uh, unnecessary updates in things like computes and observations. So you can get performance advantages if you want to make a bunch of changes and then um, it all within a batch. So for the most part. Um, and queuing things isn't something that anybody who's using CanJS needs to do. Um, it's mostly for developers of CanJS. And there's also a helper that's um, very nice to use, basically a helper that enqueues a bunch of tasks and calls batch start and stop all at once. And this is in queue by queue. This is really useful if you're creating event handlers, as we talked about in um, uh, with can key tree, 
if your can key tree kind of stores values, its handlers organized by the queue, so this could be a list of handlers to call, and queue by queue kind of does everything for you. It's a nice utility that you'll see strewn about CanJS um, when it's calling back event handlers. Um, so let's under, let's go back to the task order. Let's let's talk about um, let's talk about these queues, these different queues. So really, can queues is a queuing system made up of four separate discrete queues, and I'll talk about what each one does. Um, I'll talk about it on a high level first, and then we'll go into an example. So the notify queue. Um, that's used to alert things that might derive their value that some, something has changed. This is like a way of essentially you're listening to a change in something, but you want to be alerted to it before any users might be alerted to it. You can register an event handler in the notify queue is, is typically what you're doing on our observables. All right, so things run there are really supposed to be the, the really all of the queues, the first three queues, are kind of supposed to be run in kind of internal to CanJS. And the mutate queue is really for when users get their callbacks called. So the notify queue is just there to say, hey, I want to listen to when something changes. Tell me about it right away in the notify queue. The derive queue is there for things like observations to say, I want, once I've found a change, once I've, I've been notified of a change, I want to schedule an update to my value. I want to derive my new value. That happens in the derive queue. The DOM UI queue, that's kind of like the derive queue, but it's for where all DOM updates should happen, right? State has been settled here. State has been settled here. We know the values, kind of final values of everything. Now we're going to update the DOM. And then the final thing is we call all user callbacks in the mutate queue. So if they want to look at the DOM, well, the DOM is set. The, you know, if they want to read any other values, they are, they are stable. So that's why there's these four queues. So do they each like dequeue fully before the next one begins? Like does the notify queue empty itself, then the derive queue like empties itself, then done? Yes, that's exactly that what happens. Yeah. yeah, and if a, like I was, I said, like okay. I was saying before, if if um, if let's say something in the DOM UI queue, like you know, for some reason a change there or some some function that was in queued here, um, added something to the notify queue, we would start at the notify queue again, empty that, and then come back to the DOM UI queue, like part way through the DOM UI queue. Like yes. Before it goes to the next. Okay. Before yeah. it goes to the next task. Um, okay. So let's see how this work plays out with an example. Um, in this example, we're going to create a person. We're going to create kind of a compute. This is the low-level version of a compute, which is an observation that calculates that same their name or their info. Their you know Fran is fifteen. And we're going to render that with stash, that, that info, and append that to the, do, the DOM. And we're also going to, just for fun, listen when person's age changes and console log that. And you'll notice here, one thing that you should do in 4.0, that if you want to assist with your debugging, is anytime you have like a function, give that function a name. Don't make it an anonymous function. And then can observation will make de your debugging life much, much easier. Um, some places CanJS will actually name things for you. Uh, so, but if you start debugging with CanQs and you see it logging stuff without a name, just you can always click that function, find where that function is defined, and give it a name. Um, I think it's a really good pattern. So let's talk about. I wish this was small enough so I can see this. I should have almost put this on, on top. So I'm going to make this a little bit small so people might have to like squinch their eyes um, a bit. Or what I, I can hear, I can know what I can do. OK, so let's talk about what happens here. 
just just how things are going to get inserted into the queue um, with this code. So I'm about to change person uh, Fran's age to 22. Okay. So the first thing that's going to happen is um, for when um, this observation is going to be listening to persons on age changed and want to have that run in the notify queue. So when persons on age changed, uh, persons age changes, it's gonna call back, it's gonna enter in, in the notify queue, um, a basically the handler that this observation put on person, right? And then the notify queue has something and it's going to run. And then this observation is gonna say, oh, one of my dependencies just changed. And what it's gonna say is now what I wanna do is put, uh, an, I want to update myself. So it's gonna put, register an update to happen in the derive queue for this info um, observation, right? And then that's gonna be run. What, actually, I forgot one other thing. Because we're listening to age changing here, not only will the, the on age change be put in the notify queue, the mutate queue will also get this log age change put in the mutate queue. But it doesn't run right away, right? It's registered in the mutate queue, but it doesn't run because we haven't finished what's in the derive queue and the DOM UI. Anyway, so um, update info is going to be run. And then uh, it's, it's, its value is going to be recalculated. So this function is going to be run. It's going to have a new value for info, right? Now, can stash is listening for those info changes, but it registers its all of its changes in the DOM UI queue, right? And so it, just sorry, yeah. Justin. Uh, Bianca is asking um, why does it go into the mutate queue? Because by default, that's a great question. By default, whenever you bind to something like this, the way that users bind to it, it's implicitly listening uh, on the mutate queue. This handler, all observables know to add handlers to the mutate queue. So that, that's a great question. So when, um, like I was saying, once the value of info has updated, um, this the stash is listening. Hey, it's saying, hey, I want to listen to when info changes, but call me back in the DOM UI queue. So when info dispatches its event handlers, it's actually going to basically put in uh, in queue a task to s update the inner HTML, right? Then the derive queue is empty because we ran that. And then we're going to run the DOM UI queue, which is going to update the inner HTML. So the page is going to be updated to say Fran is, what I do, 22. And then, and then the DOM UI queue is empty. Then it's going to run onto the mutate queue. See that we've, we've registered this and run this. So this is why, essentially, if you look at the page, if you read, like, went to H2 and did inner HTML, it's going to be what you expect. Um, if you read info, it's going to be what you expect. This is how it all works. Any reason it's called the mutate queue instead of like the user queue or something? I was thinking about user queue. Um, it's mutate because it allows for um, mutations. This is where a user could listen to, um, you know, person's age changing and then somewhere do like, you know, foo dot bar equals Z, right? It's, 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 that's where muta all mutations should happen. Now the DOM UIQ actually mutations can happen there, but they're only to the DOM is really the only place that they're really supposed to happen. Um, but the, that's why it's called a mutate queue is it's because what I'd really like in the future is, I mean, I don't know if it's possible, but it, if it was ever possible to like identify mutations happening in somehow these other queues, like we could actually say, we could check which queue we're in in like a, a compute. If you had a compute in here that was like somehow setting the value, and this task got, you know, this task gets put in the update queue, 
or in the, the derive queue, we could actually say like, hey, you should not be doing this. So you should be doing all these things in the mutate queue. That's kind of why it's called the mutate queue is because it's like, it's supposed to allow mutations. You don't have to allow mutations, but that's what it's for. Um, okay, so let's talk about debugging, which is the big, big part of the reason why we built this. Um, can queues comes with two methods, log and log stack, that let you log what the queuing system is doing. Um, one problem with when you have a queuing system, which CanJS has had since like 2.0, uh, that batching system, is that the call stack, if you just look at the call stack, it might not be immediately understandable what actually happened that caused the, the piece of code or whatever you've got your debugger to actually run. Things are a little disjointed with a queuing system. So CanJS tries to, in 4.0, make that a lot easier to understand um, with this log and log stack method. Especially log stack is useful. Log is really useful, too, if you're like debugging hardcore things inside CanJS, but, but I've, I think log is really where it's at. So this is that same example from before of four are very similar. We've just got person, we've got their info, and we're listening to when info changed. If I wanted to know what caused any one part of CanJS to change, I could put in, replace this console log, or put next to it a can queues log stack call. And it would output something like this. It would say, oh, it's because Observe object, it, this is actually what it does output. Observe object is set to, was set to 22, and it would say, okay, the update info, this is also why you name things like this. Update info, on uh, one of its dependencies changed, and then it updated its value, and there's more information in here, uh, which I'll talk about in a second, and, and then your on info changed method called. So this allows you to trace from kind of the perspective of CanJS exactly why something happened. Hey, Justin, a question from the chat. Um, oh, uh, he just took it back. But um, I, could you um, kind of walk through why, um, like, how the on dependency change is part of the notify queue and then the update is part of the drive queue? Why that is? Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, in this example again, um, this observation wants to immediately know when any of its source observables has changed. So it sets up notify bindings on person. And then all observations should update their value. And this would be true if like, you know, if we if we kind of wanted to make our own observable system, anything that derives from another value um, should happen in the derive queue. So really what's happening is, is observations being notified in the notify queue, but doesn't actually update itself un until the derive queue. And the reason is because this might actually have like 10 different dependencies and all of them, a bunch of them might have changed. You might, and you only want to really update yourself once. This is that whole batching thing so that you let the notify queue complete all of the different changes, and then the derive queue, things that we'll see in the derive queue only get kind of, they only get entered once. Um, so this observation, even if person name and person age were both mutated, um, both changed, it would be notified for both, but it's only going to actually add one, um, one task to update itself in the mutate or in the, uh, in the derive queue. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Yeah, so, th so then anyways, the rest of it is the, the stash template is listening on this info it, it, to register all of its tasks in the uh, DOM UI queue. So that's why the updating of the page happens there. And then all the user stuff happens in the mutate queue by default. Cool, cool. good questions today. All right, um, so yeah, so I was talking about how these things, 
Um, so I was sh showing how a log stack, what that produces. Now the only nice thing about this is, this is trying to me approximate what, um, what Chrome will log. It actually logs the task, each task for one of these. And if you expand this, it includes the function that was run, the context for it, the arguments, and a meta object, which has a bunch of other useful information, such as the reason why everything was run. So a lot of times, if you, if you didn't end up labeling your functions like I did up here, what you'll see is like observation and then nothing inside of here. Uh, what you can always do, of course, is click the ex extend. You can kind of work your way to figuring out that observation and that function. And then say like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna actually name that function so that oh, I'm gonna run it again and see now I have better names. I can kind of see what's, what's going on a little bit better. That's been my pattern. We're gonna create a whole debugging guide and I'm gonna go through that eventually. This talk is much more focused on, on cues. Um, but can cues is a big part of that debugging guide. Um, so there's also a log method. Oh, I realized, oh, I didn't go back uh, and make it so that it puts these in. This is me, this is actually a documentation error, not an error with can cues, but there's also a log method that um, if you call it, just it, it logs when a task is in queued and a task has been run. So it's really gonna show a lot of the same thing for this example, but this just keeps going forever as your application is changing. Um, which show pretty much the exact same information. Typically, you don't want to need to log everything. And queuing doesn't really help you unless you're doing some kind of, you know, you, you're really debugging CanJS's internals. For users, what they would typically want to do is only log when tasks are run. So you you log when the queue is flushed, essentially, um, and that would not log any of these kind of in queuing steps, which are just a little bit, um, a little bit noisy. Okay, so let's talk about how it works. The first, before we do that, um, there's three different types of queues in can queues. There's a basic queue, which just runs tasks first in, first out. So when a task gets put in, it just runs it, and then the second it can't, the, the, it'll run the next one immediately after that. There's a completion queue, which makes sure that each function is run before any other queues might run a task. Um, there's a priority queue, which um, runs tasks, which is part, which is also a completion queue. Like a priority queue is also a completion queue, but it also has this ad additional feature where it runs tasks in order of their priority. And at least this priority queue also only allows one task to run. Like you can only, and queue a function one time for the lifetime of like kind of a uh, a batch of queues, a batch of tasks. And this, how it works out is notify queue is a basic queue, mutate queue is a basic queue, derive queue is the priority queue, and the DOM UI queue is a completion queue. Um, basic queues are the fastest and like nothing really matters. You just want to get events out as fast as possible. That's why they're notify and mutate queues. The derive queue is the priority queue because again, we only want to derive our value once. And we want to make sure that like if somehow another task, like derive task was like uh, entered and then flushed right away or like someone try to reflush the derive queue, it doesn't matter. We're not going to actually run any other queues until that that task that we're on is fully run to completion. And the same thing is with the DOM. Um, you don't want tasks stepping on each other. So let's see how it's all implemented. OK, so at first, can queues has this queue state. <laughs> and all it does is tracks what is the last task to be queued. Sorry, to be run. Um, this is really for the debugging, for log and for log um, trace um, and for uh, trace log log stack, so that we know 
when a task is run, we can see any other tasks that are in queued because that task was run. So this is a little bit of statefulness I'll put in its own file that a lot of, all of the other queues need to use. They need whenever whenever they're in queuing something, they, they need to update this last task, um, or when they're running something, they, they need to do that. Okay. So then the different queues are created. Uh, this is the basic queue. This one is, you know, if you want a, a very simple queue, the one to look at. Um, essentially, it keeps a, a list of its tasks in an array, um, and it knows which task it's on by this index. Um, you'll notice that our queues have these callbacks so that they can know when the first task has been added and when the last task has been complete. They can do callbacks. And you'll see here the def default is to update the, the, the queue state to say, hey, there, there is the last ta we're done with tasks. There is no like last task anymore. That's, that's the default behavior. <clears throat> OK, so in queuing a task is really easy. We just take the function context args and meta metadata and just push that into tasks. And then we call this log in queue, which will log it if appropriate. And if that was the first task to be added, we just do call the callback. It's really simple. I'll see, show what log does in a moment. Let me zoom in one more here. Uh, flush. Flushing a task is, is, is pretty simple. So one thing we do is we don't like, we keep all of the tasks in memory until the queue has been completely flushed, mostly because I don't want to be mutating an array or doing anything like that. Because uh, all this needs to run, and I'm not really worried about holding on to these functions until the queue. Because typically in CanJS, like the queue runs, it emptied, and then fine, go garbage collect all these functions. I, I don't really even want garbage collecting running during when these queues are happening. So that's why we use an index to walk through the tasks instead of like um, shifting them off the task list. Right? It's just faster to do things this way. We Log flush. Now you'll notice because of you know Daco or whatever the we're actually doing steal remove start and remove end. So all of the logging is only in development. Uh, it doesn't happen in production. Um, and then I actually run the task. Simple enough. And then when all tasks are done, I set the index back to zero. I I basically pointed a new array for tasks and I call on complete. Pretty pretty straightforward. The only other kind of interesting thing is that. When you call log in queue, that will make sure the task's metadata knows the parent task that caused this task to be in queued. Um, and log flush, when a task is run, actually sets that task as kind of the current task that's been run. So this is how we can actually keep the stack, log stack. And every queue when it's flushing or in queue, it needs to call. They all inherit from queue, all the other queue types, and they all need to call log in queue and log flush. OK. So let's look at completion queue. Uh, this one is just the same, inherits everything. It only changes flush. And all this does is make sure we can only actually run, t like, if flush is called multiple times um, while tasks are still being um, run, it will just ignore the flush and go on. It, it, it kind of protects itself, You kind of using a counter, well, literally using a counter, increments the flush count, and then decrements it, um, making sure that nobody else can, can, can run a task. And it just does the same kind of stuff that the other one did. It's just pretty much just wrapping the flushing. OK, then there's the real crazy one, which is priority queue. And this is the one that's used for um, can observation. And this is when I said 2.3 really had two queuing systems, but we didn't know it. This was me porting can uh, uh, observation in 2.3's queuing system to its own priority queue system. Um, in CanJS, there's the we want to make sure that observations in stash, like stash builds observations, that they run in a particular order. Basically, 
it, we want the observations that are highest up on the DOM to be notified first and to update themselves first because they might want, because the children might be gone, right? If you change an if to going to the else, you want to destroy all of the children and tear, have them tear down all of their bindings and never even be updated. So the priority queue allows us to set a priority on when queues should be updated, and then it will go through that list of uh, tasks in priority order and run them in priority order. Zero being the highest priority, things will run first, and infinity being that which runs last. It keeps all of the tasks in a um, array of arrays for the most part, essentially, this is an, an, ob, uh, an array where each item in that array is a list of tasks and where, which index we've run that, uh, this is the index of which task we've run within this task list. So if we ran the one, two, three, four, and well, the zero, one, two, three, and fourth tasks in here, we've already kind of executed those, this will be four. Um, and then each, Index in this 0, 1, 2, 3 is a priority and the task for those priorities. We maintain kind of a which priority um, have we run. Um, so this is like if we've run all of the zero base priorities, cur priority index will be zero. And if we've enqueued priorities at 100, this will be kind of kept at 100 and this grows. So if you enqueue something at 200, which you should never have something that high, then we know that we, we, we will go through this array until the 200th item to keep finding queues. And essentially what we're doing is iterating from this number up to this number. That's why they're reversed right now is to make it so that like we immediately exit because our current priority index is greater than our max. We'll see that in a second. So this does this kind of the same, when, when you enqueue something, it's gonna make sure this function has, wasn't already enqueued. It builds the task, asks for, hey, get me the container in tasks array. Get me like one of these things at the right position for the task that's being queued based around its priority. Gets that task container, adds it to its tasks, and then, this queuing system also wants us to be able to kind of like, if, if a task was queued, sometimes you want to just be able to immediately run it because maybe a compute or maybe an observation, depending on another observation that is actually in here, but later higher priority, which can happen in some weird circumstances that I'm not going to get into. Um, we, we sometimes need, there's a method here to be able to, flush a queued task. So maybe this task has already been flushed, but we want to kind of preempt it. Who cares about priority? Um, by keeping a mapping of the function to its task, we can quickly find and execute it and remove it from its task container. Anyways, all this is to say, let's just look at the, I, I don't want to spend too much more time on this. Um, the flush is really where the, the action is. Put it, put it simply, um, as things are being enqueued, the current priority index and the max priority index are being updated. We just, we, we kind of set up a while loop that just will take the, get the current task containers for the given priority. That's the lowest priority. And then as long as we have some tasks, we'll run the next one. And then let's say we ran out of tasks in that task container for that priority, then we go to the next priority. And at what point we have gotten to the maximum priority inserted in kind of the, the tasks by priority array, then we reset our state and we com we've completed this queue. Uh, we've completed this flush. So that's, that's really it. We, we kind of keep a few cursors and we move them around. Okay, so the final thing is can queues assembles all of this. Can queues uh, essentially uses those queue types to create the notify derived DOM UI queue mutate queue and makes them so that when they're complete, 
they call the next queue. So notify queue will call the derive queue, derive queue will call the dime UI queue, and so on. Um, it implements the batches counter so that when the batches counter is zero, as long as you actually added a task, it's going to no flush the notify queue. Um, implements the queue by uh, and queue by queue helper stack log stack those kind of things just just by you know um, because when things are in queued they always have this parent task we just keep we take the the last task that was executed we just keep walking up parent tasks to get everything that every task that has been run um, log just calls all the other queues so really the nice thing about this is like for the most part, you, you build your queuing logic, then you just wire up your different queues, and it all works. It's, this part is actually really simple. It's just, there's a lot of power to it, but it's, it's relatively simple. Um, so that is, that is that, I think. Let me see if there's another part. Oh, the only other thing I wanted to show was in queue by queue, this is what I was talking about where in queue by queue and key tree can work really nicely together. Let's say I wanted to observe, make it my own observable. I could use key tree um, to store uh, handlers by the key that you want to bind to, then the queue you want those handlers to be fired in, and then the actual handlers. So what an on when someone listen uses can reflect on key value, I'm going to add a handler for that key for the queue that was requested, default it to mutate, and then add the handler. And then dispatching is pretty simple. I can just, if I want to dispatch all handlers in the right queue for the given key, I can just get that node essentially get that part of the tree, that branch of the tree for the key, and that is already organized by queue and then to an array of handlers. So I can just in queue, call in queue by queue, um, pass it what I want my this to be, what I want the arguments to all those handlers to be, and then this is that if I want things to be really nice, um, I'm gonna give it a reason why it happened, and I'm gonna say, hey, this observable uh, key change to new value. So that way this gets printed if someone uses log, uh, log stack at the top of the stack. When someone changes, you know, maybe the key value. So that's it. That's a, that's a lot, but hopefully, uh, hopefully makes sense. Are there any questions? I have a question, but maybe it's annoying. I didn't see when you were in the code, in the Docker code there, where it would do the part where if you're halfway through a, a lower queue and something gets added to the higher queue, that it would go up and finish that before going back. So that's because, well, the, the reason why it works that way is because um, you got to remember that uh, CanJS's queuing system is synchronous. So if let's say um, you enqueued something into the notify queue and then the notify queue is flushed, then that happens synchronously and will basically just start the whole walking of all um, tasks again, starting from the notify queue onward. I'm not sure if that makes sense. But like, let's say here in the DOM UI, um, someone like did an in queue by queue or like did a can queues, a queues batch start and a queues batch stop, but in queued something in the notify queue. Well, stop is always going to restart the notify queue. It's going to call notify queue flush, which then is going to run all of these. And then that when that's empty, run all of these. And when these are empty, which they'd be empty already, run all of these. And then it would come here and be like, okay. I can see that you're already running because of the um, right. completion Boy, queue, where we say, oh, flush count is zero, and we just exit. We we'll just say, okay, well, I'm not going to do anything. And then essentially, all of that 
that um, that stack would be unwound, and then you'd go right back to that the next line of that task that was entering, and you would kind of go hit this while loop again to hit the next one. Okay, yeah, I see that. Cool. So I, I would say that for the most part, you don't want that, right? The queuing system works best when um, there isn't too much going backwards because you you know you do like put a, a few things on the on the stack, um, which hopefully doesn't happen, right? That's why it's like you should really be able to get to the mutate queue. And then it might go back, which is more or less okay. What about like, so in that example on this page, a little bit up, where you were making an info compute, what if in that income info compute, you like did what you aren't supposed to do and set a value somewhere? Is that gonna like bust up the queue system or is that gonna just be fine? I mean, like if you were to set a value on some other observable or something at this point. What it would do is add noti notify queue. It would, it would, it would it would add more uh, notifies and then that would restart and and run um, it would be mostly okay I think I'm sure there's like a, a case where I could come up with given a lot of time where it would cause some weirdness but it it would it would only cause the sort of um, weirdness that would be the non-determinism that we talked about before right, right yeah which you know the at some point, you can't really, you know, avoid. But that's why, like I was talking about, it be good. one thing we Based could do. Is, warnings, yeah. Well, one thing we could do now is really just put in a warning and just check which queue is being run. And if you're in the, if you're not in the um, mutate queue, then you 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 whine about it. So that that's not something I did, but is is um, you know pretty seems like a good idea. Easily doable, um, yeah. Cool. All right, so uh, thanks everyone for following along. Hopefully uh, the Q stuff is useful, will be, especially the debugging stuff will be as useful to you as I have found it for me. There's nothing else. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks, Justin. Thanks a lot. Jason, thanks.